Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you today. Glad that you're here to worship with us at Quaker Gap. I especially want to welcome anyone who may be here for the first time. And uh, if you are a guest with us today, we just ask that you might take uh, this little tear-off section in our bulletin, fill that out with the information requested, let us know who you are, drop that in one of our offering boxes, and uh, we're glad that you chose to worship with us today. In addition to that, at the bottom of that same slip of paper, if you have a prayer request, would you write down that prayer request and drop it in one of our offering boxes as well? So there are some announcements today. If you have your bulletin, I want to just point out a few things to you. Uh, First of all, um, from 2 to 4 this afternoon, there is a baby sprinkle in the multipurpose room. That's the Sunday school class at the far end of uh, the building down here. And that is for Meredith Van Meter and little Odie. And so if uh, you would like to be here, uh, that'd be a wonderful time of encouragement for her and her family. Uh, Also let you know that Tuesday morning at 6 a.m. we have men's breakfast Bible study at P.B. Clark's in King. Also the Friendly Club is headed Tuesday morning meeting at the church at 11 going to Olympic Restaurant in Walnut Cove. And then uh, in addition to that, you can read all of the other announcements that are found here in the bulletin. Don't forget our Wednesday evening Bible study at 7 o'clock. We'd love to see you. We've had some great conversations in the past couple of weeks in that uh, time together, and you are certainly welcome. There's always room for more. On the back of your bulletin, I just want to point out that uh, we do have We Worship, and I'm grateful for those who are serving for uh, Mark and Annette who are serving today, and Alicia and Jacob who serve next week. But we need more helpers, and uh, if you would like to help out with We Worship, you'd just be required to do it every five weeks or so, and um, all of the um, material is provided for you. So uh, there's information about that on the back of the bulletin if you would like to help out. Uh, Also, we have some uh, updates on our nominating committee process, so Clint Hartgrove is going to come and share with us this morning. Okay, um, we are, again, thanks everybody for getting your, um, your request and everything sent in. And we got together this week and we sort of got everything laid out and it helps to see uh, where we have some pockets of opportunities for you. Uh, so these are, the, these are what is out there where we really need help. And so we'll talk about those first. So if you have any gifts, talents, or just sheer interest in children's church and gap kids, um, help is still needed there with the kitchen committee, with the ushers, greeters, uh, the folks who uh, meet you and greet you in the mornings at the doors, uh, if you have an interest in there, and also youth Sunday school teacher. We need one more youth Sunday school teacher in that area right now. So if these are something that resonates with you uh, as you hear it, or if you just sort of have a, I want to do something more or different or just start in an area, and don't quite know what that is, give one of us on the uh, nominating committee a call, and we'd be glad to talk through that and sort of see where you're interested in and and help you uh, find that slot. So our our goal is to try to get the rest of this done this week uh, so we can get it put together and uh, get that ready, um, and we'll uh, vote on it the uh, second Sunday in September. But um, thanks for your time, your help, and your support, and uh, just pray about this this week as uh, as God... uh, leads you to that door that's been open for you. Thanks a lot. That does it for our announcements this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. (coughs) Heavenly Father, we are grateful to gather together in your presence today to be with brothers and sisters in Christ, to lift up our worship and praise toward your throne. We ask, Lord, that you would be pleased with all that takes place here. We're grateful for your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and all that he has done for us. Help us, Lord, to be people who love you and promote the gospel throughout this world. Now use this time, Lord, to glorify yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen to the reading of the word from Colossians 1, 15 through 20. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him 
and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. I'm going to ask you to stand and let's sing together, Firm Foundation and Light of the World, sing hallelujah. I show my firm foundation, I know I can stand secure. Jesus, show my firm foundation, I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Jesus, show my firm foundation, I know I can stand secure. living hope I have a living hope I have a future I have a future God has a plan for me of this I'm sure of this I'm sure I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Your word is faithful. Your word is faithful. Mighty and power. Mighty and power. God has delivered me. God has delivered me. Of this I'm sure. Of this I'm sure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. You're my firm foundation I put my hope in your holy word 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 Across the earth, send the shadows to light. Light of the world, from the beginning, the tragedies of time were no match for your love. From high heights of glory. Story God, you entered in and became one of us. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah for the things he has done. Come and adore him. Oh, yeah. 
singing this morning. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Psalm 146, verses 1 through 10. That's in your pew Bible on page 447, or it's also inside of your bulletin if you'd like to follow along there. Psalm 146, 1 through 10. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, the Lord who remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the alien and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how we thank you, O God, for who you are. Lord, for the compassion, the love that you demonstrate toward the people that you have created. For your willingness to send your own son into this world to suffer and die for our sins. For the way that you, through your son, have set us free from our sins so that all who believe in you have forgiveness and eternal hope. We're so grateful, O oh God, for who you are and for what you have done in our midst. And for each and every day that you shine your brilliance in our world, Father, we are overcome by your beauty and by your grace. Today, Lord, as we gather together, we just hope, Lord, that you would use your word to speak to us. Father, that we might understand who you are and be able to apply that to our lives day by day. Lord, we want to pray for those who are um, in having difficulty today for those who are hurting. We pray, Father, for healing. 
We pray for those who are hospitalized and ask, Lord, for a quick recovery. Uh, We want to pray for those who have had uh, recent surgeries and ask, Lord, that uh, they would be strengthened and, Father, that you would extend their lives as a result. Uh, Father, we are just grateful to know that you are in control, that you are the great physician, that in all of our times of need, physically, spiritually, emotionally, we can turn to you. So we're grateful, God, for who you are today. Uh, Lord, we're we're thankful for the way that you are spreading your word throughout this world and pray, Father, that you would be with uh, like-minded churches throughout this world today, that the gospel would be preached, that you would be with uh, missionaries, Lord, around this world who are sharing the truth of who you are. Father, that there would be ears and hearts prepared to hear, Lord, that there would be revival here in this country. We're grateful, Lord, to gather together and uh, to praise your name and to listen to your word and pray, Lord, that you would use this day to inspire us, to challenge us, to help us to grow. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
busload of politicians was driving down a country road when all of a sudden the bus ran off the road and crashed into a tree in an old farmer's field. And the old farmer, after seeing what had happened, went over to investigate, and he then proceeded to dig a hole to bury the politicians. Well, a few days later, the local sheriff came out and saw the crashed bus and asked the old farmer where all the politicians had gone. And the old farmer said that he had buried them. The sheriff asked the farmer, were they all dead? And the old farmer replied, well, some of them said they weren't, but you know how politicians lie. (laughs) Uh, Look, many of us have much more in common with that farmer than we think. Uh, Although I imagine that some would ask first about party affiliation before breaking out the shovels. Uh, When it comes to politics, our nation is divided. Are we more divided than ever before? I don't know. We've been divided for a long, long time. Uh, The church is divided over politics too. Back in the 21st century, or it is the 21st century now, Now, in the 21st century, statistics show that the majority of Southern Baptists are Republican. But did you know that in the 20th century, the majority of Southern Baptists were Democrat? Uh, In in fact, Billy Graham was a lifelong registered Democrat. That doesn't mean he always voted Democrat, but, but he was affiliated with the Democratic Party. And so as we continue our series of messages, Good Questions, which is prompted by your submitted questions, I come to a question about politics. And so I summarize the question like this. Why do Christians vote for candidates who support sin? And so uh, the, the literal question went like this. Why do people that claim to be Christians still vote for people that support sin? For example, abortion, homosexuality, corruption, government waste, etc., And then they gave one perspective, maybe their perspective, maybe they're low-information voters. Uh, So they're giving uh, some voters the benefit of the doubt and saying, maybe they don't know any better. But this is the question, why do Christians vote for candidates who support sin? And so first sex, then politics. You people are not making this easy on me at all. (laughs) Um, The truth of the matter is this. There is something that everyone in the voting process has in common. Every single one of them is a sinner. Every single name on the ballot represents a sinner. There are no perfect candidates. None of the candidates can be trusted to always do what is right. And and add to that the fact that every voter who walks into the polling place and writes their name down and votes, is also a sinner. So what is an election? Well, it is sinners voting for sinners to govern sinners. That's an election. Why do Christians vote for candidates who support sin? Because the only way to avoid it completely is not to vote at all. So what if I had two glasses of water here this morning, and what if I said to you, you must drink one or the other? These are your choices, one or the other. But wait, before you make your choice, let me let you know that I've put some drops of invisible odorless poison into them both. Now, different kinds of poison, but all of it's poison. A a few drops of one kind of poison in this glass, a few drops of a different kind of poison in the other glass, and now you have to choose which one you're going to drink. Some of you might say, well, I refuse to drink from either of those. Okay, that's all right. That's your choice. But in the end, you're going to have to drink from one or the other. So you have to choose which one you're going to drink from. Or by choosing neither you're going to let everyone else decide which one you're going to drink from. So what's it going to be? Now we can give you an opportunity this morning to listen to some speeches and some campaigns and some biased news stories and some polling statistics to help you decide which one you're going to drink from. Uh, Some will try to convince you that their glass is pure and the other glass is poison. Some will convince you that their glass is less poison than the other. And in the end, you must decide which one. This is pretty much the truth of politics. This is the decision that we have to make. 
trying to decide which party has less poison in it. Sinners voting for sinners. Now, as a responsible voter, here's what I recommend. I would say, turn off the news, because it's all spun in one direction or another. Read the platforms. You know, you can download these political platforms online. The Republican platform and the Democratic platform are available online for you to read. Read what they say, what they are all about, what their plan is, what their agendas are. Now, you're going to have to parse some of the language. You're going to agree with some, you're going to disagree with others, and you're going to have to parse the language and understand something. For example, when the Democratic platform speaks of reproductive rights, they don't mean the right to reproduce. That's something that can only come from God. What they mean by reproductive rights is the right to have an abortion. Seems backwards, doesn't it? Um, They talk about it as a women's health issue in their platform, but they never talk about the fact that at least half, if not more, of the babies being boarded are female. What about those women's health? Now, just in case you think the Republican platform speaks out against abortion, it's not there. I've read it. There's no doubt that President Trump nominated Supreme Court justices who overturned Roe v. Wade. That's true. But all that did was to send the battle back to the states. And this year, if you've been paying attention, there is no mention of an abortion ban in the Republican platform. I think when it comes to the issue of abortion, both parties are poisoned. You have to decide which one's poisoned more than the other. So what I recommend is that you read the platforms, you consider the character of the candidates, compare them to your values and your beliefs as an American citizen, as a believer in Jesus Christ, then go to the polling place and vote for the least offensive candidate among the sinners listed on the ballot. That's what you need to do. But recognize as you do that the Messiah is not on that ballot. Drink the one with the least poison and don't expect to get much from either. So does that sound pessimistic? I'm sorry, but I can't help but compare the poisoned leaders of this world to the pure leader over all. And that's where we're going today. There's simply no comparison. What I'm going to do with the rest of my time is a bait and switch. Understand that now. You know the way that works. When you were a kid, right, they they used to have these things called newspapers, and there would be advertisements in the newspapers from the local car dealership, and it would tell you about a specific brand new car and give you an unbelievable price on that car. You would take that ad, cut it out of the newspaper, and run down to the dealership, come to the lot, and talk to the salesman and say, I want this car. And the salesman would say, oh, well, that car's already been sold. Truth is, he sold it to his brother-in-law the night before the ad came out for that price. But you're not getting that price. So what he does is a bait and switch. That car's already sold. However, let me show you some other cars that we have on the lot. That is a bait and switch. That's what I'm doing today. Now that I've got you on the lot, I'm going to upsell you from politics to worship. That's what I want to do. I reserve... The remainder of my time to preach a message on Psalm 146. That's what I'm going to do. So David was the king over Israel. He had one vote that put him into office. One vote. It was the anointing of the Lord. He rose from the ranks of shepherd to become king. But if David is the author of Psalm 146, recognize this. He knows his own heart as a ruler. For he says, do not put your trust in princes. Do not put your trust in princes. So I want us to recognize some truth from Scripture this morning that will help us to put politics in proper perspective. We're going to put politics in proper perspective this morning. You see, politics has become a spiritual issue for too many believers. Who you vote for, according to some, is more important to them than who you worship or how you live. They put it to that level. 
that voting is more of a spiritual issue than many of the other issues of life. It's become a test of your Christianity for some. I was taught that when you mix religion with politics, you get politics every time. Some people look at the world through Republican, Republican glasses, some look at it through Democrat glasses, and depending on which glasses you wear, you're going to see things completely different. And my point here is that we all need to put on our Jesus glasses. We all need to put on our Bible glasses. And to look at this world, not from the perspective of a political party, one or the other, but through the perspective of what the Word of God says. So let's look at Psalm 146, written by a king in order to bring glory to the King of Kings. So first, we must give God top-level praise. Top-level praise belongs to God. The praise and glory and respect that we give in this world needs to be directed first and foremost to God. Am I saying that there are no praiseworthy human beings? No, I'm not. Certainly there are some commendable men and women in this world and even in the political process, but our highest praise is reserved for the King of kings and Lord of lords. So the psalmist begins by saying, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. If this is David, he's saying, don't praise me, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in Hebrew is two words, hallelujah and yah. Hallelujah and yah. Yah is short for Yahweh. Hallelujah. Say that with me. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. Y'all sound like Baptists. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Okay. All right. <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's what that means when we sing that this morning. First, the psalmist turns to his re readers and he says, hallelujah, y'all. Hallelujah, y'all. What I mean by that is it's the second person plural. He's saying, y'all need to praise the Lord with me, is what he says. Hallelujah, y'all. You know, those of us up north might have said it, you guys need to praise the Lord. But it's the second person plural. Y'all need to praise the Lord. And he begins and ends the psalm with those words of admonition and exultation. Hallelujah. Now, but when he, he turns it inward then, after he talks to those that he writes this psalm for, he turns it inward from speaking to his readers to speaking to himself and says, praise the Lord, my soul. My soul. Now, his soul is his breath, his inner being, his life. He is saying, hallelujah, all of me. Hallelujah, y'all, and hallelujah, all of me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All of me. Every inch of me. Every part of my life needs to be lived in praise of the King of kings and Lord of lords. And then he continues. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. He says, I will praise the Lord all of my duration, every day of my life, as long as I live, I will. Hallelujah. In other words, hallelujah all life long. Hallelujah, y'all. Hallelujah, all of me. Hallelujah, all life long. This is the beginning of the psalm. As long as I exist, as long as I am upright on this planet, I will hallelujah. He is worth singing about all day long. And in these words, we can't help but reflect on one of the seminal passages of the Old Testament, which says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And in the New Testament, Jesus said these words in the book of Revelation, I'm the A to Z, the first and the final beginning and conclusion. So we are to prioritize God as first in our lives and praise him above all. And once we have our priority straight when it comes to who we're going to praise, then we can begin to think about human leadership and put politics in proper perspective. The psalmist uses the word princes here, which can also be translated nobles, but since we're not living the days of kings and princes and nobility, I'm just going to use the common word, politicians. 
And while the psalmist says that we are to give God top-level praise, he then takes us down the ladder. I would say a long ladder. He takes us from praising God way down the ladder, much further down, and he says we should give politicians low-level trust. Low-level trust. In fact, he says we should not trust in princes at all. Don't put your hope in princes. Don't put your hope in politicians. Why is this? Well, first, he says, do not put your trust in princes, in human beings. Even though a man or a woman may rise to the level of government leader, even though they may be called the leader of the free world or the commander-in-chief or whatever accolades that we might call a president, that man or woman is still a human being. Literally, in the original Hebrew, the the psalmist says, do not put your trust in ben Adam, the children of Adam. Do not put your trust in princes, in the children of Adam. Anybody that can take, uh, you know, one of those um, tests, check their DNA, that can trace their heritage back to Adam and Eve, don't trust them, he says. Don't trust them. Now, can people be trustworthy sometimes? Are there good people in the world that you can trust? Yes, but in comparison to praising the Lord and trusting in the Lord, he's saying you cannot trust in human princes. Adam blew it. He fell. He sinned. And all his sons and daughters follow in his footsteps. So expect that politicians will be sinners too. Since all princes are sons of Adam's, you should expect that politicians disappoint. Politicians disappoint. They will all make promises, and they will all break promises. They may say they're going to build a wall or fix Social Security or bring down the price of gasoline, but in order to do that, they have to work with all the other princes and princesses in Congress. And we know that our government system is good at doing nothing and getting nothing done. The psalmist says they cannot save. They cannot save. This can be taken physically and spiritually. Look, politicians can promise peace and security, but the world is full of terrorists and evildoers and war, and they cannot guarantee anything. Politicians cannot deliver you from all the difficulties of life. They will disappoint you. Psalm 37, 39 says, The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. Where do you turn in your time of need? Do you call your representative or do you get on your knees? As soon as we recognize where our ultimate security comes from, we will look away from the leaders of this world for our help and for our hope, and we recognize that they are capable of leading, but they are incapable of saving because they are children of Adam just like us. Something else is true of them. Scripture says when their spirit departs, they return to the ground. The word for spirit can also be translated breath here. The New English translation puts it like this. Their life's breath departs. They return to the ground. The truth about human beings is that we are temporary. So B is politicians not only disappoint, but they disappear. They disappear. Even the greatest of politicians will serve for what? Four years, maybe eight we may sing, happy days are here again. You know, I remember those days <laughs> I, I, when, when they showed the, uh, the winning, the victor's um, war room or whatever they called it. And all the people were together at some hotel somewhere in the country and they were singing, happy days are here again. And their candidate had won. They were so excited. But then the next day, <laughs> reality strikes. Happy days are temporary. One administration gives way to another. Any gains that were made by one administration will be lost by another. And as we have learned, one accurate bullet can end an administration in a second, in a second. But not only do all politicians end up in the grave as well as we do, the point the psalmist makes is that not only do they die, but all their plans die with them. Their agenda, their platform dies with them. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground, it says. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. 
This is one of the problems with putting your trust in sons and daughters of Adam is that they are temporary and their plans will come to nothing when they are buried in the grave. Another way of saying this is see platforms drift. Politicians disappoint, politicians disappear, and platforms drift. They are constantly changing. In fact, if you were to look at the Democratic platform, which is about 91 pages long, you, as you were reading through it, you'd recognize that the wrong name is in the platform. That even after all this time, it still talks about Joe Biden as being the candidate. They haven't changed it yet. I guess they're working on that. Someone is, you know, uh, ferociously trying to edit that, that document to try to make it sound more like the new candidate. All of the agendas of even the most successful world leaders pass from the scene with time. And we talk about some of those world leaders that were just and that were good and righteous. Uh, and we talk about how wonderful things were under their administration. But sometimes I think hindsight is not 2020. Hindsight sometimes is hopeful. You know, the world situation is not a diagonally increasing line. That things are getting better, things are getting better, things are getting better. It's more like a roller coaster, inconsistent. And if you haven't noticed in our nation, the pendulum shifts from one party to the other to the other. Well, let's try this party. Well, that didn't work. Let's try this party. Well, that didn't work. And back and forth and back and forth we go. And we experience recession and inflation and depression and growth. And sometimes when we least expect it because of the leadership or in spite of the leadership, things go well. Is the politician able to tame the bucking bronco or just sit on top of it and survive while it goes wherever it's going to go to begin with? It's hard to tell. Because all world leaders are nothing but children of Adam. They are all sinners. They are all ultimately powerless. And they will pass away from the face of the earth along with all of their victories and defeats. The leaders of this world would be smart to take David's advice. That's found in Psalm 2. Where he says, Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. If only you could print that out and get it in the pocket of every candidate for office so they could see uh, the, the fear of the Lord so that they could understand that their job is to serve the people by serving the Lord. So if we're not to trust in the world leaders and politicians, then who can we trust? The psalmist takes us back again. He says, Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. Blessed are those whose God is the God of Israel, whose hope is in Yahweh, God. Number three is God gives high-level hope. High-level hope. The word for blessed here can also be translated happy. Happy are those. As opposed to the prince of this world, the Lord provides present help and perpetual hope. Help and hope, this passage talks about. Therefore, anyone who praises the Lord and does not put their trust in politicians will be blessed, it says. Will be happy. The message version puts it this way. Do, don't put your life in the hands of experts who know nothing of life, of salvation life. Mere humans don't have what it takes. When they die, their projects die with them. Instead, get help from the God of Jacob. Put your hope in God and know real blessing. If your hope is in the Lord, you can't go wrong. And then you can put politics in proper perspective. The psalmist encourages us uh, to, first of all, count on your creator. Count on your creator. The psalmist said, he is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in, in them. He remains faithful forever. Do you see the contrast? 
I hope you see it. Politicians are powerless sinners who can't keep their promises, whose plans only last as four years or maybe eight. But God is the one who made all things. He is sovereign over all that he has created. He is all powerful. He is everlasting and he remains faithful forever. That's something that no world leader could ever promise. So vote for whoever you think is going to do the best job in Washington. But for eternity, there is only one God and one creator. And only one Savior who can be trusted with your life forever and ever. So get your values straight. And because he is the creator and the God over it all, he cannot be bribed or swayed by any favors. There is no corruption whatsoever in the Creator. Now, I need to tell you something about the political platforms again. You can go to the websites and look them up. The Democratic Party platform is 91 pages long. And as I said, they still haven't changed the platform from Biden to Harris. Now, you don't need to read the whole thing. Just read the table of contents. You'll get the idea. Let me give you some of the bullet points that are found there. For example... Combating the climate crisis and pursuing environmental justice. I don't know what environmental justice is, but when I read the section about that, I was shocked. I was shocked by what they are promoting. Creating a 21st century immigration system. The problem with that is that they've been in power for the last four years and have done nothing but open the border. How can they create a new immigration system when, at this point, the immigration system that we have in place is not being honored? And then healing the soul of America. Can a political party really promise to heal the soul of America? And the way that they propose healing the soul of America, if you were to look in the the specifics, is actually damning the soul of America, if you read it closely. You don't have to read it. (laughs) You don't have to read it. But as far as the Republican platform, you know, it's much shorter but it makes all sorts of hyperbolic statements, such as our future, our identity, and our very way of life are under threat like never before. You know, whatever you may believe about the importance of the times we live in, they can't compare to the Civil War or the Great Depression or the World Wars. I think sometimes we look at our situation that we live in and we think it's worse than anyone has ever had it. So be careful when we use these statements. It also says when America is united, confident, and committed to our principles, it will never fail. You know, I'm all for optimism and patriotism, but there's only one kingdom that will never fail, and that is the kingdom of God. So here in Psalm 146, we see the Lord's platform. What are his promises? What is a world like when God is praised and worshipped and is seated on the throne? The picture the psalmist draws for us is that his platform is perfect. His platform is perfect. The psalmist describes the platform of the Lord when it comes to ruling human beings. There are three points here. One is genuine justice. Genuine justice. A lot of politicians talk about justice. But the world's idea of justice and God's actual justice are two different things altogether. You see, when it comes to justice, the world argues what is just and what is right. The left and the right do not agree on justice. The right emphasizes equality of opportunity. The left emphasizes equality of outcome. God is the one who creates all men equal. Unfortunately, our broken world doesn't afford equal opportunities for anyone. And equal outcomes are not just. A jury of peers influenced by high-priced lawyers lets the guilty go free while the innocent end up in prison. And our justice system, I believe, is one of the best in the world, but it's far from perfect. Far from perfect. The justice of God, however, is built on truth. God sees all all. God knows all. There is nothing hidden from him. He always punishes sin. He always rewards righteousness. God is a friend to the one who has been dealt a raw deal. Verse 7 says, it was for uh, that he upholds the cause of the oppressed and he gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. It was for 
those who have been oppressed that Jesus died. The word for prisoner here refers to captives, prisoners of war. It's not saying that we should empty out all of our prisons or that that's what God is going to do. But what it means is that those who have been unjustly imprisoned are set free by the Lord. The Lord sees the plight of those who have been oppressed. He notices the hungry. He knows each prisoner by name. And God always does what is just. Jesus came to set free those who were oppressed and held captive by sin. Jesus came to fill the hungry with good things. His miraculous meals of 5,000 people or more are nothing compared to the eternal feast that he has prepared. The platform of Jesus is a platform of freedom and justice for all who believe. You know, before his birth, Mary, the mother of Jesus, rejoiced, and she said, He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. So you can see that the platform of the Savior begins with genuine justice, a God who knows those who are oppressed and is a Savior for them. And our passage continues. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. So in addition to genuine justice, the Lord's platform is also capable compassion. Capable compassion. It's one thing to be compassionate. It's one thing to pity those who are in need, to pity the blind and show concern for the fallen. That's an honorable thing. But the Lord's compassion is capable compassion. Not only does he pity the blind, he opens their eyes. Not only does he show concern for the fallen, he lifts them up. The Lord knows who is righteous and he demonstrates loving kindness to them. Read the Gospels and you'll see it. Every time that Jesus shows compassion, he follows through. He follows through. It's not just a feeling, it's an action. Look at these examples. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Doesn't say he had compassion on them and then went away. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. The compassion of Jesus is always followed by action. American politics, meanwhile, has deteriorated into a club of rich men and women who talk about helping people in need, but rarely deliver. Those who go to Washington to represent their constituency all too often end up representing special interest groups and lobbies. But our Lord delivers a platform of genuine justice, capable compassion, and moral mercy. Moral mercy. The psalmist says, the Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. So while human government sets up systems to help people who are in need, people have learned how to abuse, take advantage of, and cheat the system. And those who need help suffer while those who abuse the system prosper. It's an ugly process. The Lord, however, shows mercy to the hurt and the brokenhearted. He knows the needs of people and is able to help where it is needed. You cannot abuse the mercy of God. The Lord is especially merciful to those the world forgets about, though those that the world ignores, foreigners and widows and orphans. In the New Testament, we see the values of the Lord expressed. In James 1.27, it says, Religion that our God, our Father, accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Interestingly enough, that is the verse that was on the front of our bulletin this morning. Sometimes that happens, you know. Uh, and we don't choose the bulletin. Look, if you look at the back of the bulletin on the bottom, it has the date on there. 08-25-24. That's today. 
It just so happens that every now and then, <laughs> the bulletin matches the message. This is what God accepts as good religion, to look after those in need, the orphans and the widows in their distress. What is God's plan for welcoming foreigners and providing for orphans and for needy widows? It's the church. It's the church. The body of Christ. God demonstrates his mercy through us to those in need. There is no more glorifying thing that we can do for the Lord than to be his hands and feet in helping those in need, whether they be strangers, widows, orphans, or anyone in need. God uses us to glorify himself by stepping out in obedience to him. Every election season, the political parties put out their platforms. And you can go back and read them from past election years. But the record is clear. The presidential administrations have not even come close to fulfilling their plans. The platform of the Lord, however, is a beautiful thing to behold. It's beautiful because not only does he make the promises, he keeps his promises. And imagine a world where the Lord's platform of genuine justice and capable compassion and moral mercy were in full force. I believe we'll have to wait till the day when Jesus on, is on the throne to experience that type of platform. This is what the kingdom of God is all about. And we should not settle for anything less. When Jesus is the king and Lord over all, all the promises that politicians and the governments have failed to deliver will be delivered. And not temporarily. Even the most successful administrations are temporary. But the kingdom of God is forever. His empire is eternal. His empire is eternal. Psalm 146 concludes, The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh, when we compare the politics of this world with the eternal kingdom of God, all we can say is hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So what are we to do in the meantime? Yes, we are citizens of the kingdom of God, and we look forward to a day when he will come and bring in his everlasting administration. Praise God. That is our first, foremost priority and responsibility is to live as citizens of the kingdom of God and to look forward to his coming. But what are we supposed to do in the meantime? We live in the United States of America, and we should be engaged in the political process. I want to encourage you to vote, to register to vote, to vote. We should do our best to vote responsibly according to our values and what we believe. Read those, read those platforms and make a decision for yourself. But I want to warn you of a pitfall. I want to give you a piece of advice this morning. It would be this. Stop overemphasizing politics. Step away from the politics. The media wants to suck you in and over-dramatize the political process. And if you watch the news and you find yourself becoming anxious, turn it off. Turn it off. If you're the type that listens to political podcasts and YouTubers and you become angry and frustrated and you become mad at people, unplug it. Turn it off. You know, there used to be a day during the political process where in the newspaper there might be a little blurb about, you know, the candidate, whether it was Roosevelt or um, someone else, <laughs> names escape me at the moment, um, where that candidate, you know, stopped somewhere in the country and gave a speech. There might be a little blurb. Today, you turn on the television set and they can't get up in the morning and have breakfast without it being reported. Every word that they speak is analyzed and taken apart and, uh, and sensationalized. And, and it's over and over and over again, 24-7, because the people who report these things make money off of it. And they want to keep you engaged. If you're the type of person that checks the polls and your mood immediately changes based on what that poll says, recognize this, the polls are notoriously wrong. And news organizations, news organizations tweak those polls constantly to favor their candidate of choice. Recognize that. So don't even look at the poll. The best thing you can do is decide who you're going to vote for, turn it off, stop listening to these talking heads, turn on some music, listen to the birds singing, and then show up on election day and vote. 
And when the results come in, no matter who wins, don't panic, don't freak out. It's not the end of the world. Everything's going to be fine. God is in control. Sinners are voting for sinners to govern sinners, but God is sovereign above it all. Martin Luther King Jr. visited Bennett College in Greensboro back in 1958, and while he was there, he was interviewed, and when he was asked about the upcoming elections, he said, I'm not here to tell you how to vote. That isn't my concern. I'm not a politician. I have no political ambitions. I don't think the Republican Party is a party full of the Almighty God, nor is the Democratic Party. They both have weaknesses. And I'm not inextricably bound to either party. I'm not concerned about telling you what party to vote for. But what I'm saying is this, that we must gain the ballot and use it wisely. And I agree with Dr. King. Vote wisely and don't super spiritualize the process. And beyond that, for such a time as this, we don't need a politician. We need a savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for who you are. We are thankful, Lord, that in a nation filled with contentious politicians, with anger and hatred and difficult words, in a nation that's filled with platforms and agendas and people reaching for power, in a world that's filled with cash that is flowing in both directions in unbelievable quantities, that could be used to do good. We are glad that you are in control. Teach us, Lord, to praise your name and to bow our knee to, our knee to you and not to, to trust in those who lead us or those who run to lead us. Help us, Lord, during this election season to keep our mind and to keep our heart fixed on you. And Father, to use our vote to do the best good we think we can. But then, Lord, to leave the process with you because we know that ultimately you are in control and you hold the world leaders in your hand. And, Father, you are steering history toward the plans that you have, and it doesn't matter who sits in the White House. You are in control. You are in charge. So help us, Lord, to worship you and say hallelujah every day. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. While passing through this world of sin. Father, we thank you for this time of worship this morning. We pray that your name has been glorified. As we leave this place, Lord, help us to hallelujah all day long, all life long. Help us to praise the Lord, for it's in your name that we pray. Amen.